Hi, my name is Mani Ali Khan. I'm the director of CTOR, Center for um, Application of Science to Advanced Clinical uh, Treatment. In our centers, we have created many theories, patents, and appliances that are commercially available and uh, can be used daily for comfort uh, of the patients and better result. Today, we're gonna to discuss about one of these theories and how we can use it clinically. Uh, in orthodontics, transverse forces has been used for treatment of uh, many orthopedic problems such as correction of crossbite. The assumption behind this treatment is that application of transverse forces produce a physical phenomenon by separating the hemimaxilla or separating maxilla from adjacent bone. In response to this physical phenomenon, later on we have bone formation that occurs inside the sutures. But is that true? To answer this question, we conducted a detailed study in rats to assess the effect of expansion on skeletal, dental, and sutural widening at different time points. We focus on the mid-palatal suture, but we also evaluate the effect of expansion on the adacrinofacial sutures. Animals were divided into four groups, untreated control, sham, experimental, and experimental plus non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, or NSAIDs. Transverse force was applied to the maxilla through a tooth-anchored expander for 0, 1, 3, 7, 14, and 28 days. Skulls and sutures were evaluated using microcomputed tomography, fluorescence and light microscopy, gene and protein expression, and immunohistochemistry. We measured the width of the sutures, palate, and dentition in three-dimensional micro-CT images. As expected, the mid-palatal suture width increased significantly throughout the study period in the experimental group compared to the sham group, with a peak at day 7. Surprisingly, although the suture was significantly wider on days 14 and 28, the width steadily decreased on those days, which also coincided with significant increases in the palatal and dental widths. Transverse force on maxillary teeth also widened the zygomaticotemporal, zygomaticomaxillary, frontomaxillary, and transverse sutures. Similar to the midpalatal suture, the widths of each suture peaked at day 7, and although still significantly wider, narrowed at day 14. These results clearly show that sutural widening occurs ahead of dental and skeletal changes, but they did not follow a linear relation. More interesting is that all the circumaxillary sutures, even those exposed to compression, were wider. Surprised? Now, let's look at what happens to these sutures at the cellular level. We investigated the presence of osteoclasts by trap staining in the mid-palatal suture. Compared to the sham group, the suture in the experimental group developed a marked change in its cellular organization. There was also a significant increase in the number of trap-positive osteoclasts on days 3, 7, and 14, which correlated with the peak sutural widening. Similarly, the expression of osteoclast markers rank, osteoprotogerin, rank ligand, and cathepsin K significantly increased on days 3, 7, and 14 in the experimental group compared to the sham group. This increase in osteoclast number and activity at the mid-palatal suture and surrounding bone resulted in a significant decrease in BV over TV in the palate of experimental animals compared to sham animals at each day of the study period. Now the next question is there any similarity between the PDL and suture in response to application of forces? We know that in the predental ligament, in response to orthodontics forces, there is a transient inflammatory reaction. Do we see the same inflammatory reaction in sutures in response to application of transverse forces to maxilla? We next looked at the level of inflammatory markers in both the mid-palatal suture and the periodontal ligament during expansion. 
Surprisingly, the pattern of cytokine expression was very similar in the suture and PDL. So could this initial inflammatory response recruit the osteoclasts and induce osteoclastogenesis at the sutures? And what happens if we inhibit this inflammatory response? What happens to expansion? To answer these questions, we added non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication, or NSAIDs, to the drinking water of rats undergoing maxillary expansion. NSAIDs clearly reduced the number of osteoclasts in the mid-palatal suture and inhibited the expression of osteoclast markers in cytokines. We conclude from this data that a robust inflammatory response that leads to recruitment and activation of osteoclasts is the first response to expansion. Now the question is, can we expand the maxilla if we inhibit this inflammatory response with NSAIDs? As you can see in these micro-CT images, osteoclast inhibition with NSAIDs prevented the increase in the mid palatal suture width and in the maxillary skeletal width seen in the experimental group. This data clearly demonstrates that inflammation-dependent recruitment and activation of osteoclasts is essential for sutural, skeletal, and dental expansion in orthodontics. For dickheads, we taught that application of orthodontics forces, transverse forces, uh, directly can stimulate bone formation in the sutures. If this assumption is correct, one expects that ap appearance of bone formation activity would be simultaneous as application of transverse forces. But is this concept is correct? We measured the time course of osteoblast marker expression. Cal1A1 and alkaline phosphatase had the most rapid increase with significantly elevated levels throughout the study period that peaked at day 7. Osteopontin was significantly elevated on day 7 to 28, while osteonectin was significantly increased on days 14 and 28. As you can see, the anabolic response occurs later than the catabolic response in maxillary expansion. Could it be that similar to what we observe in the periodontal ligament in response to orthodontic forces, Osteoclast activation not only precedes the osteogenic response, but it's essential for it to occur. Indeed, osteoclast inhibition with NSAIDs also inhibit the osteogenic response to expansion forces. But the dose of NSAIDs used in this experiment did not have any effect on the basal osteogenic activity in the sham group. So in summary, you will see that first, in response to transverse forces, you have an inflammatory reaction that brings the osteoclast, activate the osteoclast, and in response to osteoclast activity, we have osteoclast activity. So these pre-assumptions uh, uh, that we had before, that in response to transverse forces, we have bone formation, is actually was not correct. If that's the case, the target cells that clinicians need to focus on is osteoclast. Osteoclast working as a biological knife. Precision of a laser that cuts maxilla separate from the skull and allow the clinician to put the maxilla in any special relationship that he likes. After that, these osteoclasts that are activating the osteoclast and provide the integrity that connect the maxilla back to the skull. So the target of all this studies should be osteoglass and the question would be for the future how we can more efficiently activate the osteoclast in the places that we want at the time that we want and how we can stimulate the bone formation more precisely after we activate the osteoclast.